Welcome to my show, the Health, Happiness and Planet podcast. In today's episode, we are going to focus more on the area of happiness that comes from changing your mindset. In case you're listening to this while you are driving, cooking, cleaning the house, commuting, walking, jogging or anywhere else where you are not able to take notes while listening, then no worries. I included a downloadable freebie where you will find the key takeaways and an action plan. You can pick one to two action points out of this plan, implement it into your schedule and see how you feel. Do you feel more energized? Do you feel happier? And you will find the link to this freebie in the show notes. I have the pleasure of welcoming an amazing guest from the beautiful city of Valencia, Spain. Her name is Annie. She is passionate about helping others in their personal development. In 2018, she started a project called Annie Now, in which she provides her clients with techniques for well-being and self-discovery, concentrating on the physical and mental aspects. On the physical part, she focuses on yoga, pilates, aerial hammocks, conscious training and nutrition. On the mental and emotional side, Annie focuses on humanistic therapy, which is especially good for people with high sensitivity. She spends her time coaching people online and in person. She is also known for her regular nature retreats in Spain. During our conversation, we learned about her passion. We spoke about IQ and emotional intelligence. We touched the topic on society and their rules and what seems to be normal or not normal in society and how this affects people's happiness. We covered the definition of self-discovery and humanistic therapy and Annie revealed one of the tools that make her happier in life, which is her yoga practice and she now accompanies her clients in their yoga journey and making them feel more energized and balanced. I am delighted to introduce you to this amazing guest, Annie. Welcome, Annie. Thanks a lot for coming to this uh, podcast today. It's an honor to have you here on board. What are you passionate about? It's always interesting to see what fires up people. Well, first, it's really nice to be here. Well, what am I passionate about? People, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly the way we work, the way our mind develops. I don't know, the way we feel. I don't know if the word is mystery because there are a lot of questions answered already in that direction, but we are definitely really interesting creatures. Why some of us evolve in a direction, why some of us evolve in another direction, how we can find out how that can affect us. When we realize we are not only our mind, when we realize we are not only a body, it's amazing. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and, and how... Did she find this um, this part of, of this passion that you have about people and finding all of this out? Uh, was this at a very early age or was it something that you just uh, discovered recently? How did that come to you? I remember myself being on the table with all of my family and I was maybe seven or eight and they were arguing and not understanding each other and I was staring at you know all the parts and I would just pop up and say I think what he's saying is that what he means is that and then everyone would be like shut up <laughs> the adults are talking yeah and I was like no you are just arguing <laughs> My family is just like hot blood, you know, we could say. Maybe that's where I found out that I was really interested in being able to make people understand themselves and to make them understand each other. Maybe it comes from there. Wow, that's pretty interesting because I think if, if you already had that type of... Um observations when you were a child yeah. that means that you're already a natural born uh, empath yeah you can feel yeah. what others feel <laughs> <Definitely>. and <laughs> everyone that knows me can know that yeah there you're probably going to score extremely high in emotional intelligence <laughs> <laughs> Could be, yeah. <laughs> because it, it was awkward now when you said the story because i felt the same when i was small because i grew up with my grandparents and when they would argue for me, it was like a very hard argument and I could feel like these emotions going mm -hmm. between them, even though for them it was just like everyday bread and butter that they had yeah. discussions about things, but they did not see it as something crucial. But for me as a kid, I thought like, wow, this is really, really bad. And I was always trying to be like the people pleaser, yeah, to make everybody happy and try to find a balance in the family and not to be a problem maker and just uh, not to have that situation. And every time I was thinking about 
how can I create an environment where they do not have to argue? How do I Wow, that's a lot of responsibility oh, for yeah. a kid. Yeah, and that's why that's, I think, not the easy part for people who are sensitive and who have that type of, um, I would say, observations and empath feelings. Um, and that's why when I was later in school and they said, oh, we're going to do the IQ test for the kids you know, to see which universities are they going to go to. And I was thinking, like, what? Are they going to be measuring people on their intelligence depending on what questions are there? And um, I didn't really believe in that. So when I did that uh, test, somehow it came out like not a very high score from that IQ test. So I'm like, okay, so does this mean now that because of that result, I'm going to be having a bad future because I cannot go to the high class universities or anything? And I found that, like, just somehow the, the system was not, like, somehow right set up. But then later, when I was in the corporate world and I was working as a manager, they were sending managers to courses where they would be analyzed by psychologists to see how they can even make you a better manager. And there they did this um, emotional intelligence test. And we were going through this program. And the person who did the test on me, they were like, wow. I've never seen such high scores like it in came out industry. on me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> then I was thinking back to my school days when I said, okay, I had a very low IQ test result, but I had a very high emotional intelligence result. And that's why maybe it still helps individuals to progress in whatever goals you have. The good thing, I never took it very seriously that they say, okay, because this test results saying that I have a low IQ, that um, I'm just already pre-programming myself saying, okay, I'm just not going to make it in life. Uh, for me, it was just the opposite. I'm just saying, okay, that's totally BS, this whole test. Wow. And <laughs> that's powerful because I could not do that. Actually, I didn't go to university and I feel mm -hmm. that that's the main thing, you know. Yeah. I'm still working on a lot of stuff that I went through mm -hmm. because I was actually a highly sensitive person. I am I am still. And uh, I had not the easiest situation personally at home and all that. So mm -hmm. I would go home with all my school tasks, but it was not as easy to me as some other people to just take care of that because I was taking care of a lot of emotional stuff. Like I felt I would do it. I would get to somewhere, but I thought it was going to be because of, I don't know how to say it in English, like being if cheeky is the word, mm -hmm. you know, like being yeah. smart and climbing yeah. and all that. Yeah. Years after that, I found out that science is my thing, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. mm, science of, of behavior, science of the mind, mm -hmm. science of even biological. I am a yoga teacher, so I have to w work with the body of people mm -hmm. and I have to find out how our hormones make us go through a path or another, you know, yeah. that was my thing. And I couldn't realize it at school. It's a situation, it's a concrete mm -hmm. moment, but yeah. it's not saying what is your life going to be, but they tell us it's yeah. like that. Correct. It just reminds me now of the story of Edison. Yeah, When he was in school, they sent a letter to his mom saying that, sorry, but we're not going to continue having your child in our school because he doesn't fit into the system and he is just um, not smart enough. So she had to teach her son uh, the books and the things that she knew at home and he never could then participate in school and that he did not know uh, she actually kept that away from him he just thought okay I'm just at home and studying with my mom but later when he was an adult and he was already a very famous person because he invented this new technology and the mm. light bulb and everything uh, he found a letter uh, that the school sent to his mom and his mom was not around anymore in those days and he already had like his office with hundreds of employees doing new inventions every every year and then he opened the letter and uh, and he was like what the school actually kicked me out because I was not intelligent enough and I did not uh, fit into their system yeah so he was like totally shocked that was again for me like excellent story to say that just because you don't fit in a certain block yeah that it, it does not mean that you're not going to be happy or successful in your life yeah, and that's the why. worst is that it's not uh, just a story you know it's not only Edison Einstein felt yeah. the same way a lot of the biggest artists in this last decade relate the same story exactly one of the things then which I just right now also picked up that you did not go to university and I also did not go to university because I was oh. against the whole system really <laughs> yeah I didn't <laughs> and I just say, okay, I'm going to just do totally opposite what others do. So when I finished school, I told my parents, you know what, I, I was living in South America. So I told them I'm going to go to Germany. I'm going to learn the language and I'm just 
going to start working. And my dad was like, what, you're not going to study anything? You, you, you know, you could go to university in the U.S. So I said, no, I'm just going to do a different track and a different way because I know that there's so many different routes to get to your goals that I do not have to go to the route that everybody says you need to go that way. And that's why when I went to Germany, I learned the language and I started working in a company where I did my apprenticeship. So I had to like study and work at the same time in this company. And then I, I just said, okay, I'm going to try to work myself up in the corporate ladder without any kind of uh, like help from my parents or, or any kind of background studies like from universities and diplomas. A couple of years later, I noticed it was possible. I was in the, the management position where I was in the highest level in, in a corporate world where we had all the senior managers. And I said, okay, I was still able to achieve my goals and even faster than all the other people who took university and entered into the corporate world. And I noticed that there was something that was missing because when they came into the corporate world five, six years later after the studies, they know a lot about the theory, but they do not know about the practice. They do not know the real world. How is it like when you're working in, the, in such an environment? And in my case, I had five years less of university, but I was already five years working in this environment. So I already knew how people were thinking. I knew what I needed to say to get certain results. I knew how mm -hmm. to uh, motivate people when, when they did not want to do certain projects. And I say, hey, guys, you know, we need to get it because of this and, and really try to find a psychology behind it to, to get everybody motivated and energized. And these are the things that the newcomers who came from universities with an MBA, they were not able to do. So that's why I do not say it, it's bad or good if you have an MBA or not. It's great if you do. But my message here is that you do have different ways of achieving your goals. There's not just one right way or, or a wrong way to do things. Um, yeah, definitely. So I'm sure about that topic, we can talk quite long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and one of the things that you also have is about the topic self-discovery. So, so how do you mm -hmm. define self-discovery? Well, <laughs> how do I define it? Well, to me, uh, long ago, I realized that life has no one right path. So being able to realize which are your differences the way you see the world, the way you understand stuff, which are your skills, I think that makes it easier for you to understand that you don't have to fit into the life that everyone says the way life is. You just have to realize how it is supposed to be and then you can adjust it a bit for you to fit in your own concept of what living life is, you know. Thinking of standards creates a lot of mental disease, a lot. Uh, every single person that I work with, when they start the process, they come saying, like, I'm not sure I'm normal. I don't understand why this is happening to me because I think the rest of the people don't suffer because of things like this. And all that is talking about how they think if you don't fit in what normal is supposed to be, <laughs> you're wrong. Yeah. But that's not true. Uh -huh. For example, yeah. I can see that in introverts. Mm -hmm. Introverts, uh, they grow up thinking that there's some issue with them. Mm -hmm. Just because they prefer like a bit more silence than some other people, they prefer to pick up properly with who they are related. Mm -hmm. They need to create a more private sense of life and comfortable and slower and less loud yeah but they grow up thinking there's something wrong with them because we all want to fit in the same definition and that's not necessarily like that yeah in a yoga class for example i never work with levels you know there's no uh, one level and uh, a level two level three mm -hmm. because everyone can fit in the same class also because of the way i understand and i teach yoga i think it reflects the world as i think it should be When you see people of 67 mm -hmm. adjusting their asana because they cannot do it the same way as the person they have on their side, yeah. but they are enjoying the practice and they all fit in the same class because we don't judge each other. Yeah. We understand that and that's beautiful because we can be together. We can enjoy the experience of the other person yeah. exactly because it's not the same as ours. Correct. And uh, what's very important, what you said, it's about uh, when people say, I'm not normal. What do you define normal? What is being normal? Yeah, it's just 
if you look at data, yeah, if you see what is the majority of the people like or what do they do, what they don't do, it could fall into a lot of clusters of information, of data points. And if you think you're doing something that is out of that cluster, then why do you think that that's not normal? And actually every single data point of the way you are, the way you do things, the what you like, what you don't like, it's totally unique to yourself. And for sure out there, there is, as I say, your your tribe. Yeah. So you can attract your tribe of people who are similar like you. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people in their early stages of their life, they do not know that there are others just like them out there. And they just feel that they're totally alone because they think, oh, I'm the only one who's like closed up or introverted or, or need to energize when I'm by myself and alone. And I do not want to make others feel bad about it because people might think, oh, he's just not uh, social enough. And that was something that I felt maybe sometimes a little bit guilty when I was young because I would say 80% of the kids in my class would all go to uh, discotheque and party and, and I was the one just staying at home with my grandparents. I would go maybe to the gym, work out, come back home, listen to music, maybe read something and go to bed like at 10 o'clock at night. And for me, I was like, wow, it's totally in my zone. And for the others, they're like, oh man, that's such a weird kid. Yeah, he doesn't go out. He doesn't socialize much. And I did have, of course, my friends, but it was only maybe one or two of my friends who I always was like this high quality type of friends that I was searching for, while others, they energize more when they are with big masses of people and they could go to a bar or to a discotheque and they're just being around with people, they feel fully energized. And for others, like in that case for me, also as an introvert, that's totally draining. I, my energy is like, if, if I would go to a discotheque, I think I would need like two days vacation after that just to recuperate. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I think it's important for the young people who are also listening to this uh, show, that there is a lot of different types of people out there and you have your own tribe somewhere. If you would really like to connect with them, uh, that is probably one of the things that you will then find out throughout your life that you will be attracting. Uh, Your vibes will attract your tribe. And Mm -hmm. uh, do not try to be somebody else because then you're just not being you and uh, you're not going to be happy inside of your skin. And one of the things which I've also uh, heard about during our discussions was about humanistic therapy. (laughs) (laughs) What is behind the humanistic therapy? Because I I just know the word therapy as therapy. Of course, I know that there are a lot of categories. And Mm -hmm. what is the category from humanistic therapy? Well, it's a kind of therapy that is trying to help the person find out who she or he is, not the way she would like, but the way she actually is, and try to help them find space to be who they are and just find self-acceptance and even self-respect and Mm self-friendship. That's a term that I really like. You can observe your wills. You can observe your necessities. And then uh, you just need to ask yourself, why can't I just be like this? You know, how can I do it for the world around me? Not all the world, you know, because we cannot control everything. And that's something we all (laughs) have to remember often, me, myself, for example, too. But there's a tiny space around you. And that tiny space is most of the time the only space that you need for you to be comfortable. And in that space, you can design your life at some levels. I always uh, make the same example. It's like your place, like your apartment. Mm -hmm. It would be strange and stupid to buy yourself an apartment and then just realize how everyone in your neighborhood has designed their apartment or put the furniture for you to know how you have to put the furniture. You need to ask yourself, which kind of materials do I need? Do I like plants? Do I like carpets? Do I need to feel cozy? Do I need to feel modern? And then your apartment becomes your tiny space in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Living inside yourself is kind of the same Mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that, everyone feels like, oh, I didn't know I could be just like that. Just be. I didn't know I could be. It happens a lot with sensitive persons, with sensitive people. They are often feeling and thinking that they are too sensitive. Mm -hmm. They are too this, too that. Because, for example, there's no good communication out there. Not Mm -hmm. easy one, you know. And sensitive people 
need to communicate to understand each other, to be closer to the people they care about. We sensitive people don't feel like being arguing, as you say, like butter and bread. <laughs> you know, I cannot do that. I need you to understand what I mean. I want to understand what you mean. So humanistic therapy to me is like getting to know yourself the way you are most of the time, maybe not the way you would like to be, mm -hmm. because we would like to be as the society says so. It's just getting to know who you are and how you can make your life easier and nice and cozy and comfortable. And that's why I think um, if you want to change the world around you, you first have to see what's happening first inside of you yeah, and that you can really be comfortable with the way and who you are and uh, and treat yourself kindly and also in your thoughts yeah because you you at the end of the day you have to be your own best friend yeah? and once you can do that then you can radiate that that positive emotions to others and and create a change but if you're constantly in a conflict with yourself and you're treating yourself bad the way you speak to yourself in your mind then it's going to be quite challenging to be a nice person to the outside to others and do good things for the world if you do not have that type of um, i would say relationship with yourself uh, that's why what I have seen a lot in, in the people who I've interviewed is that uh, as soon as they start taking care of themselves and, and with whom they are surrounded with, in spending time for themselves, in going out and spending time with nature, doing their workouts or their yoga, and, and just dedicating time for themselves, automatically they notice that their life just got better and, and their way of thinking got already much easier on themselves and they were able then to be nicer to the outside world. So that's that's where they, they notice that really I just need to first work on myself, make myself happy, even though it sounds a little bit like egoistic, yeah, but if everybody else first needs to focus on themselves and making myself happy, then I can start making others happy as well. So very, very interesting with uh, humanistic therapy. I've, I haven't mm -hmm. uh, heard about that in that definition uh, yet. So and when we think about therapy, we think about the psychology. We've always seen mm -hmm. like this kind of desk, no, mm -hmm. in the yeah. middle of the of the room, and, the couch. and then you see it also yeah. here in Spain. At least my age, I'm 26, and I did a lot of therapy. Uh, when I see the classic spaces for psychotherapy, it's like big desk, the person, a lot of books, mm -hmm. and if I would have to give a picture, like a mental picture for what humanistic therapy is, is like the nice sofa area of your place mm -hmm. just take a coffee and let's talk about it yeah. but also something i think it's really important i think you have to be prepared because you are working with people mm -hmm. they are coming to you in vulnerable moments of their life mm -hmm. so you are meant to know that you have a responsibility what brought me to work with this, it's the thing that I feel that I have to do with my life, you know? But at the same time, I guess because I, I took a lot of therapy and I, I love how we can help people because when I got the right help, I realized it can change everything. I have a lot of respect for what I do yeah. because there's people on the other side. Yeah. There's people trusting you to orient themselves yeah. and to grow. And they are allowing you, which is one of the things that amazes me the most. They are allowing you to see through a window how they grow mm. and how they were where they didn't want to be anymore. And then they start walking to where they want to be or they think, they feel like they have to be. Mm. Sometimes that path is not like, I am here, but I'm bored. It's like, this is painful here. Yeah. Or this doesn't feel like my place anymore. I don't know where I'm going, mm. but I just need to go. Yeah. So that path is no joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that path is most of the times is something that we can do. We can walk through, but it's a sensitive moment. 
I was quite shocked also to hear when you told me about uh, in a conversation outside with this podcast that a lot of your clients that you have they're quite young. No? So what, sure. what is what is the age group more or less that you have? Right to, now, yeah. <laughs> it's not my my only job. I am also mm -hmm. teaching yoga and all that. But right now, I have. I think four boys that are under 25. Okay. I have a girl who is not even 18. And I have another young girl, an adult woman too. They are young. Yeah. Okay. They are definitely wow. young. Yeah. And the thing is, I guess as a teenager, me, myself, I was kind of different, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes when I talk to my husband, uh, I used to tell him, when I'm a mom, I'm going to be scared of teenage area, you know? Yeah. I'm a bit scared of that. And then I started working, and then at some point, I don't know how it happened, I started getting really young people, mm -hmm. super conscious. Wow. Yeah, super conscious, super compromised, mm -hmm. super willing to take their life on their hands and just see where they can go with that you know it's amazing yeah and i think that also gives a lot of motivation for you to know that you can help them in that path you know, in that journey that they're going through at the beginning of their life and they can depending on which uh, advice you give them uh, they can really just go in different directions yeah? and, and it's really your job to make sure that you will advise them so that they can really follow their true north yeah what is their heart going which direction and not just because the father wants them to be a doctor or a lawyer but to, to see what is it that they're really passionate about and to take the right road yeah. also we may think that the doubts that a teenage boy or a teenage girl have nowadays are about who am i going to become professionally mm -hmm. and no they are wounded They're wounded by family wounds. They know they are. Mm -hmm. They find out there are some stuff, like some parts of their life where they are not being capable of understanding their partner or the girl they are dating or the boy that they like. And, you know, it's not just academic world mm -hmm. because we think that's their lives, but they are wounded. And the most amazing thing is that they are being brave to embrace that wound. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. They are willing to know and, and getting to being the ones that can hold themselves. It's amazing. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> at the end, it's like, okay, how many hats do you have a day? It's like, okay, I'm a student. That's one hat. Then I'm also a son or I am a grandson. Yeah. I am a sports person. You are just so many versions of yourself. Yeah? And you cannot just say, because I'm failing in one area, I'm not just failing as a person because you have so many other areas that you are developing yourself in. Yeah. There's something that uh, makes me get like even emotional uh, when I think about it, about my job. People think teenagers are completely out of their families, like they don't want to have anything to do with their parents. In my experience, that's not true. We don't understand that in our childhood, family is the main. In our teenage years, family is not the main because in terms of our evolution, we have to start evolving in the social area. But family is the part that is in the vase for that to be able to happen. If family fails, the social area is really difficult to accomplish. Yeah. So they are worried about that. They are worried about how they deal with their families, how their parents talk to them, how their relationship with their mom or they, their dad was when they were kids because they realized they are still hurting because of that. And this is something that bothers me a lot. It's such a pity. Yeah. It's unfair because they have real worries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They have their world. Their world is not the same as adults, mm -hmm. but it's their world. Yeah. If we don't help them with their world, they're going to be lost before adulthood. So to me, it's an amazing space where you can create so much where kids are kids and teenagers are willing to have someone that understands them and helps them, makes them feel welcome the way they are because they didn't choose to be teenagers. Yeah. They have to go through that. And we go to teenage years with the tag of, oh, teenagers, oh my God, teenagers. 
I remember now the quote of my daughter. She's 13 at the moment, and she's also saying, oh, I just don't like being a kid. I just want to be really over this phase, and I want to be an adult. Yeah, I want to do, do things what adults do. And, uh, and I was thinking, oh, that's interesting, because when I was younger, I also thought the same. I never thought that I had a young soul. I always thought I was somewhere between my 30s and 40s. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the way how Five I live. Five-year-old. Exactly, yeah. And I, that's how I, I live most of my life. And when I became 30, 35, five in that area, I was thinking, oh, wow, now I really feel that now I'm in my zone. I'm actually at the age group where I feel comfortable at. Uh, but then now when I get even older, I'm getting to my 50s. I still feel that I'm 35. Yeah, so I don't feel that I'm getting older. And when I was young, when I was a teenager, I was always feeling that I was older than, than I was actually yeah. was in, in my body. I and and I that. think I'm sure that when I'm going to be 80 years old inside, I'm still going to feel like I'm that 35 year old yeah, wanting to do so many things and being multi-passionate and curious. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, so. So it's, it's really how is your inner soul and your energy. And it's a, and, and some people I, I've known from school, their soul is like a teenager. They're always doing silly things. And even though when they're 50, they're also doing silly things. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you think is one of the factors that is not making teenagers today so happy? Because one really sees, wow, oh there's so many unhappy um, youngsters sometimes. Yeah? And what is one of those things that you said could be a potential root cause? Well, I'm going to say something that I'm not going to be original at all. I think we have a problem with social media. We have a problem not only with teenagers, but people recording their kids all the time. Three-year-old kids. Hmm. Last Christmas, I saw an amazing bunch of people having fun recording their babies, hmm. crying when the Grinch would come to the living room. Wow. just to steal their presents and the babies would explode crying mm -hmm. and adults were around just laughing at it. Wow. Amazing that things like that happen. Yeah, uh, so I think we have a problem with that. I think we have a problem with how everything is more and more all the time like put on the screen. But also I think they are in the world that we have built mm -hmm. at some point. If we can take their responsibility for that. Maybe we can help them because me, myself, for example, I tend to check which are the trends for certain ages because I have nieces mm -hmm. and I usually check which are the trends in TikTok or check what they are looking at at TikTok just to be aware. <laughs> yeah. When I see my, my nieces listening to not feminist at all music, I try to tell them, to explain them. I try to let them know what that is. We cannot be enemies of the things that our kids and our teenagers are driven to. Mm -hmm. yeah. We cannot be enemies of that because we're going to be enemies of them. So it's a difficult task, but I think we, we have to help them focus on that. Yeah. On the other side, I think we have a lack of uh, sensitivity. We have a lack of capacity of negotiation with mm -hmm. them. As long as we keep thinking that the world of the teenagers is, oh my God, these years and all that, we are not close to them. Mm -hmm. Imagine someone just looking at you and saying, oh my God, these forties of yours. It's a long topic. Yeah. And one could probably just go into different possibilities and different reasons why people are just not happy today. That exposure that they have to the social media, that they just show what does the normal perfect world should look like. Yeah, and you see all these people super nice and camera mm -hmm. and showing their car and their houses. Yeah, So all the youngsters looking at this like, oh, OK, so that means that when I'm their age, I also need to have already a car and a house. I need to look that good. I need yeah. to have that kind of body. And we were talking about this a few minutes ago. Normal does not exist. <laughs> exactly. That's right. And I think it's sometimes the realization of um, where you do not always try to be fitting into normality. You might come into a stage where you say, okay, maybe it's cool not to be normal. Just it's cool to be myself because I'm just totally different to everybody else. Maybe a, a funny comment about that, because as I started doing this project with my wife and we are walking across Europe barefoot, which is something totally out of normality for society. And that really 
changed my way of looking at things because before, as I was always that people pleaser, always trying to make things that people will feel comfortable yeah. and that there would be no conflict and that I would always be like under the radar so that nobody really knows I was there because I'm always just like in the shadows. But then when I started to walk outside without shoes, I was no more in the shadows. I was in the spotlight. Everybody was like looking and like, oh my gosh, what's that? You know, why is he walking without shoes? And that was really very uncomfortable for me at the beginning and I had to really overcome a lot of things for me inside uh, that where I would say okay I have to really see what is it that I want to accomplish what is it that I want to do what is that really resonates with me and what makes me feel good and what is harder the sensations that I was having is it much more the uncomfort of having people looking at me or was my emotion of feeling of being free of, of feeling the ground of feeling the energy of the world um, and, and doing this experiment and this project was that more important to me than the feelings of people looking at me so that's one of the things that we usually speak about in change management where they say when the, the resistance is not so high as the pleasure that you get out of it. So I said, okay, the pleasure that I get out of it is much, much higher and the resistance is there. Yes, I recognize the resistance, but it's definitely lower. So I was working with this mentally and therefore when time was going by, I was getting uh, stronger in, in my thinking that I'm not here to please everybody and I cannot make everybody happy because otherwise I'm just going to be a burden. I'm going to put this whole weight on my body and that helped me just open my mindset yeah, towards many other things. In the beginning, when I was walking barefoot, people would, would look at me and I would be like all nervous and like looking at the ground mm. and thinking like, OK, I'm trying to be invisible. And uh, But today, if somebody is looking at me, then I would like look at the person, I would smile, I would speak with them and say, how are you? And, and then they start a conversation. And I'm thinking, wow, that was actually a nice conversation we had while we were standing at the traffic light and they were curious about what I was doing. And that just gives, again, a total different uh, way how people then perceive you and the whole different way how you perceive the world outside of your body. And so before I was thinking everybody's just looking at me because they're judging me or thinking that I'm crazy or that I'm homeless. But now I know that it's not that way because when I actually start recognizing what is people looking at me for, they're just a little bit like confused or they're curious. And out of that curiosity, then we had a conversation and I just noticed, hey, they were not judging me. They were just being curious. And I was explaining to them why I was doing it and what kind of project we're doing and how am I feeling and yeah, how my body uh, is feeling so much better and I can sleep better and my joints don't hurt and all these kind of things. Things, yeah. So we, we just deviated a little bit from the topic, but um, mm. but it's it's again saying that you do not always have to try to be normal you have to fit into society in, in order to make others happy, but then you are being unhappy yourself. And now I notice I can be happy and when I'm happy, I can maybe like radiate that to others as well and, and hopefully make others happier as well and say, look, if this is what makes me happy and it did not hold me back from going barefoot, what is it that makes you happy, uh, dear neighbor? And why aren't you doing it? Maybe you can also just think about yourself to do things that makes you fulfilled and not to just do things every single day because you think that's the way you need to do it because others expect you to do that. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. interesting. So one of the things that you mentioned that you're a yoga teacher and that's mm -hmm. fantastic. And I think this is also one of the tools that you use to um, get better, I think, because yeah? you said that you also went through therapy and that you give recommendations to those who you are also helping in therapy sessions. And um, how important was yoga for you? Where do I start? Like a few years ago, I had a mental breakdown, a deep one. Everything was a stress, everything was fear. When I got to that point, I definitely had to tell myself that everything that I did till now brought me here. Now I got to do some different things. I mean, I got to start taking different decisions because what I decided consciously or unconsciously brought me to here. So you cannot do the same, that famous quote, you cannot do the same and wait for different results. So consumed by anxiety, I went to my neighborhood gym and I told them, do you have yoga classes? <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, yeah, this is Kundalini. And I said, yeah, 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 that's fine for me. <laughs> and then I got there and then I was completely terrified. Like I want to start running, but where? If the thing is in your mind, <laughs> where yeah. are you going to run? 
So I started going to these yoga classes. They were in a normal gym. For example, now I work in a really, really nice studio and with everything prepared and well taken care of. It was not the, the case for my first experiences, but I didn't need it. Mm. I just needed to sit and accept that I was not right. And I had to be patient just to find out where I was going because I was also taking therapy and all that. But I realized I would go to the yoga class with a sense of fear and I would go out with a sense of, wow, what is this? You know, like I would be capable of staring at the situation, not being completely drowned in my fear, just watching my fear and it was really weird. So I kept on taking yoga classes and I changed the stage for the mat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I used to study to be an actress and a singer. I keep on singing from time to time right now. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted that because, and that's something I found out afterwards. I just wanted that because I needed to feel loved and seen. So it had to break at some point. Yeah. Because that was not the way at all. And the warmth of the others would never make me feel better. Yeah. It was such an interesting moment in my life because I remember myself sitting on the yoga class and asking myself, okay, I don't want to be this anymore because I realize I cannot be this anymore. What if I would wake up every day to this, mm. to teach yoga, like humble way, you know? Yeah. And I thought that would not give me the sense of the stage, you know, because I used to look for dopamine levels, you know, the stage, everyone clapping and everyone looking at you and everyone thinking you're better than them because that's what happens. That's what happens when you're on stage. So I knew I wasn't going to get that, but I didn't want it anymore. Mm. So to me, yoga is the space where probably I've always belonged but I couldn't realize it. As I said at the first minutes of this podcast, I come from a family of high energy, you know? <laughs> Everything's, whoo. Yeah, fireworks everywhere. <laughs> yeah, fireworks, uh, attention, uh, yeah. loud conversations, you yeah. know? And I, I am a social person, an extrovert at some points, but I need a different, mm. I don't know how to say it, uh, a different... Uh, <laughs> a different uh, speed. Yeah, I yeah. need a different speed. Yeah. So yoga is making me feel at home yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, that's, that's quite amazing. Because if I think about my first time when I did yoga, that was probably 10 years ago. And it was such a, an amazing experience because, I mean, before that, I used to go to the gym three, four times a week. Just mm -hmm. a classical workouts that you do when you go to the gym. Just lift a bit of weights, do some machines, and then do a little bit of stretching for three minutes and then go home. And I always felt good about that. And I could feel that this energy that came from it. But then when I did my first yoga class, it was a, a course of 10 sessions. It was so amazing because we were also doing this breath work and I never did breath work in my life and I never probably had so much oxygen in my head after mm. that. I mean, I never took drugs in my life, but I felt like if I mm. took drugs mm -hmm. and I think when I got out of the session, I was walking to my car and I was probably even singing out loud, which I would never do <laughs> in, in normal day. Uh, and I was like sitting in the car and they had some silly song on and I was just singing along with the song in the car driving home. And I was just like this happy little kid. Yeah. And I just felt so energetic. And I'm thinking like, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's so unbelievable. Yeah? And, and also my body just felt so free and so light like a feather. Yeah. Since then, I was hooked into yoga and been doing it since then and one of the things that also is very important what I notice about yoga is of course the teacher so in, in this case if you're not now let's say on the stage of being in a performance but you are in the yoga stage where that's <laughs> your stage yeah, with your students kind of, yeah. yeah and that's it's so so important because the way I've been to your one yoga course and that's where I also realized that the voice of the yoga teacher is extremely yeah. important because 
my yoga teacher in, where I was in Germany, she also had a very nice voice. And then later they switched the teacher to another person and somehow there was no vibration there and I did not feel the same. But then when I took part of yoga, yoga course, and as you're also very talented in singing <laughs> and you're you. singing in between, um, I was thinking like, oh my God, I even had like tears in my eyes you know, <laughs> when I was just laying there. <laughs> it was such a nice experience. Yeah. So that's something that gave me again a lot of energy and I can feel the energy in the room as well. Yeah. People are just getting like, oh, this is so great that we're here. And, and of course, it transfers to you again yet as the teacher because you feel this whole momentum and that's why my next question is would you then recommend people who have different types of problems which coming from different types of uh, reasons or root causes uh, would yoga be one of the solutions one of the tools that they can use to be happier and more energetic okay this is a good question yoga is a blessing and you definitely experience a change because it can create a space inside of you where trouble cannot live. So yoga is an amazing tool. I think it's almost a must for recovery of a disconnection, of a emotional pain, of mental problems. But <laughs> I think you have to focus on it the right way. I'm in both worlds. And I am in the world of yoga and I come from a really traditional branch of yoga, from a traditional school. But I also know about psychology. I have a clinical psychology mm -hmm. master. I've been studying the science of the mind, a lot of things that we know for certain about the mind. So at some point, I would like, that's what I try to do with my work, I would like those two to communicate. Because, for example, when you have someone with a panic attack in front of you, you have to know what the strategy is to cut that out in that moment. And that's something you can find out thanks to science because it's strategy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you got to have the skills to break the ego of the people because otherwise they think they're fine until they are not fine. And they start identifying themselves with not being fine. Mm -hmm. I had a, a girl coming to my classes that was not following the therapeutic mm -hmm, yeah. uh, process with me. And she told me she has a, a obsession control disease, OCD, I think yeah, it is. Correct. When I told her acceptance of the moment is, is really important. And then she answered, yeah, I have a lot of acceptance. I have accepted myself that I'm going to be sick for the rest of my life. Wow. That's you quite see? shocking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, I wish those two worlds would communicate better. Yeah. Because yoga is all the time uh, focusing in your being, in mm. everything's evolving, everything's changing. Even sickness is not forever. Mm -hmm. Even sickness yeah. is not forever. Even the bad things in life, the good ones will change, mm -hmm. will transform. The bad too. Yeah. So I wish those two worlds would communicate better. I wish a lot of people with anxiety problems would feel more understood by their yoga teachers because mm -hmm. their yoga teachers would have a bit of, I don't know if I could say formation mm -hmm. or to be ready to understand farther than you have to breathe and relax. Breathing and relaxing is the key. But not everyone knows how to get there just because you tell them so. So there are some paths that I personally would recommend to follow in those cases. And also I would like clinical psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but I work with the mind. And that's something that I have to do because that's my way of contributing to what we have. <laughs> you know, yeah. I realized I have to overcome my complex. Correct. I have to overcome my complex of, I didn't study psychology, I didn't go to university because mm -hmm. if I stop there, yeah. I'm not going to do anything for anyone. Correct. So 
I would like clinical psychology to have that fresh air mm -hmm. that spirituality yeah. sometimes gives you, not religion. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about religion. I'm talking about the sensitivity of not putting tags on everything, understanding that, yeah, people can go through disease because we have a mind and the mind is like a kidney. It can have certain kinds of illnesses mm -hmm. and it's fine, but you are not the illness because mm -hmm. you are not the mind. That's something <laughs> that yoga and the spirituality give us. Yeah. You are the person that observes yeah. the mind and the disease. And at some point you can say, oh my God, what the fuck yeah, is going on exactly. here? But still, you are the observer. Yeah, you and know? that's something that I think a lot of people have that misconception about yoga because they just think it's about uh, doing your splits or doing your back bends perfectly. And it's yeah. not only about that physical part of being able to do a split because it's not about that. It's about the whole experience of how you continuously develop yourself in, in your body and your mind and your soul and your spirit. And that's something that I think that a lot of people only realize once they actually really start doing yoga. At the beginning, I think when I was going to the gym, I only thought that yoga was for people younger who don't want to move exactly or, or people who just want it easy and, and yeah. then when I did my first yoga course I never sweat so much in my life in yeah. any other workouts that I did in the gym before and I was I totally surprised how difficult it is mm -hmm. and I was really challenged yeah and that was just the physical part and later of course comes the spiritual part which was the thing that I was feeling more and more connected to that mm -hmm. uh, which I did not have in, in the past or maybe I, I did, but it, I did not realize it. Yeah, because I was, for example, what you mentioned, where you can observe things from a distance. Yeah, where you see certain problems happening or certain issues that are going on, and you can look at it as a third person, as you would be watching a video or a movie, and you just like look and see and just observe what's happening or what's going through your mind, what kind of thoughts are going through your mind, and you're like, oh, okay, interesting that I'm thinking about that. Why am I thinking about that? Yeah, so just looking at like a, with a different perspective. I used to do that all the time, but now that I do yoga, I'm actually aware of it that I'm doing that. So it's it's really very interesting what yoga can do for a person. Yeah. Definitely. I think it should be a part of the life of everyone. I completely understand that not everyone has to do yoga. I always like to tell the people I teach that you don't have to be a certain way to practice yoga. I mean, you don't have to sit and be like, do I have to put my mind in blank? <laughs> you know, no thoughts at all. That's nice. If you ever do that, you have to teach me. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be the teacher. Yeah. No, it's not like that. We don't have to illuminate ourselves. It's not necessary. Mm. If you, in your yoga session, get to be respective for how you are right mm. now, who you are right now, even if you like it or not, mm. just the way we are right now, where I am, this is what it is mm. right now, Come on, that's uh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah, right. you only have wow. to do that and accept that you come like this and you're always going to be thinking that the person in the mat that you have right here is much better than you. And I had a nice situation like a few months ago. I have two wonderful, my, my husband would say, you always say that about the people you teach. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> I have two wonderful women that yeah. come to my classes. And one is a bit younger than the other, but they're both adults. And the one that has grandchild, she's super sensitive. And she used to think that she was so limited. She was that, she was this. And once I told her, when we finished a private lesson, I told her, you have to stop saying you are limited. Yeah. You are where you are. Probably it's not going to stay forever. Mm -hmm. You are where you are. Yeah. That's all. And then months later, she adds to a group finally. And then the other woman, when the class finishes, says, how long have you been practicing? Like years or? And she says, no, a few months. Mm -hmm. And she said, I saw you with so much kindness, mm -hmm. so much sensitivity and practicing with so much patience yeah. that I thought, I want to be like her when I grow up. <laughs> and she started crying. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> she started crying. And that happens yeah. all the time. Amazing. We have a cruel boy saying, oh, yeah. you are, you mm. would not, you cannot, you know. And then and your someone. your beliefs, yeah. Yeah. And another person comes and sees you with the, the eyes of yeah. neutral eyes or even with loving eyes. Yeah. And then. The reality is the same, but it's another point of view. It was beautiful. Wow. That's it was amazing. really beautiful. Great story. 
Mm-hmm. Well, thanks a lot for that. And um, well, we are getting to the end of this podcast and I feel like we could still speak for another hour. Sure. And uh, <laughs> one of the things to finalize what I also thought about during our conversation, because you mentioned that um, how people maybe judge other people for the way they are, what they do, what they don't do. And it just came to my mind that at some point of time, somebody said, oh, we got sometimes things to learn from the animals. I'm thinking, what can we learn from animals? Yeah. yeah. And one of the things which I then found out was now I have a dog and, and I'm just observing this cute creature quite <laughs> often during the day. And I'm thinking, okay, one of the things that they do not do as animals, they do not judge each other. They do not say, oh, he has a nicer leash than I do, or he has a nicer bowl than I do, or he has a nicer ball than I do. The uh, they don't do that. Yeah? And that's maybe one of the things I think that we can also as humans just um, maybe think about. Yeah? Do I need to judge another person by what type of car they're driving, what type of shoes they have on, what type of watch they have? Yeah? So this is also one of the things that I think put a lot of people under lots of stress sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, very good. Before we uh, finalize the podcast, where can we find you? Where could the listeners <laughs> find you, Ani? So on Instagram, it's Ani Lobar Now Yoga, like Ahora Yoga for people that <laughs> speak Spanish. Perfect. So I'll put it on the show notes so that uh-huh. all of you can find it. And in Valencia, the yoga sessions are in Calle Cuart 122, Sintonia Studio. It's not my own studio, but I helped raise it it has a really nice energy we take care of each other in the team and it's a beautiful place so yeah thank you very much i can definitely recommend it i was there and i can (laughs) feel the positive energy in there and the caring and and love that all of you put into that studio (laughs) it's just a very lovely environment (laughs) thanks a lot ani thank you for having me thanks for listening to the show We covered today quite a lot of topics and do not worry if you did not have the time to take notes and you are not 100% sure what are the actionable steps to take. In the show notes, you will find a link to a downloadable cheat sheet with a simple action plan. You can choose the action points that fit best to your current situation and then you can later make an assessment if it made you feel better and more energized. Feel free to let me know how it went. Your feedback is important for my team and I, so we can continuously improve the value we provide you as we want to give you the most out of each episode. Please rate, subscribe, send your comments and share with those family members and friends whom you think would enjoy this episode. This is greatly appreciated and I'm grateful to hear from you. I am also a work in progress and I strive to do things better each day. Thank you, take care of yourself and see you soon in the next episode. Big hugs, everyone.